Good morning, everyone. Um, my topic today is no estimates. And by what, what I mean by that is what that hashtag actually says, which is to say we need to just stop doing all estimation now, is that estimation has no value at all. And I am hoping over the course of the next 45 minutes or so I can convince you that that statement is true. The main problem with estimates is that estimates are always based on guesswork. You're always guessing. You can make a claim that estimates are based on observing past behavior, but the fact is, is that what you're implementing is something that hasn't been implemented before. So any kind of measurement that you've made of something that happened in the past is not going to impact what you're doing now, which is to say you're always guessing. Now, the problem with those guesses is that they're also always wrong, which is something that we all know, but for some reason we behave as if we didn't know that. We imagine that the estimates that we come up with have some kind of validity to them, even though we know deep down inside that they don't. Everybody that I, every programmer that I know at one point or another has complained about how bosses take their estimates as if they're bolted in concrete. And it's because we know that the estimates are bogus. But if we know that they're bogus, why don't our bosses know that they're bogus? And my answer to that is they do. So we have a very dysfunctional situation here where everybody is relying on something that doesn't work and we know as a fact that it doesn't work. Now, Woody Zwoll, who's known mostly for the mob programming scene, in the mob programming scene, came up with this hashtag oh, a couple of years ago now, it's been a while, to try and start a discussion around this problem. So my take is not exactly the same as Woody's, and in fact, Woody would be happy with that, is that the point is to have a discussion, not to have a dogma <laughs> surround, surrounding estimation. And my take is basically that estimation leads to dysfunction. It leads to situations where one is working ridiculous numbers of hours without needing to, where we have irrational schedules, which are destroying everything around us. They are destroying our lives in every way possible. And more to the point, they're making the projects that we're working on not, not succeed, simply because people don't have the energy that they need to do good work is that this all falls into this, to an agile notion of a continuous pace, of a steady pace. This idea that you can sustain your pace indefinitely. That you're working at a rate at which the, the, uh, you never get exhausted. You never come in in the morning so tired that you can't actually get work done. And the problem is that as soon as you put estimates on the scene, you can't have a sustainable pace anymore. Because as soon as you have estimates, you have deadlines, and as soon as you have deadlines, you have people working 18-hour days in order to meet those deadlines. And as soon as you have that, you have a dysfunctional workshop. So estimates are causing lots of dysfunction at the, at the process level, if you will. Now, the other problem is the one that I was alluding to a moment ago, is that a boss asks you how long something's going to take, and of course, you come up with a wild-ass guess. You have no idea how long things are going to take. But then your boss takes that and says, oh, that's a contract. He said it. You know, he said, well, maybe we can have it in six months. And the boss comes to you six months later and says, why isn't it finished? Right? So that is also a kind of dysfunction. And that's a dysfunction that impacts the business in serious ways. Because this boss is making business decisions based on a, a misconception, based on thinking that this number that you just pulled out of a hat has got some kind of reality to it. Now, Steve McConnell, who's in a way the god of estimation, or he is in some ways, because he came up with a lot of rules that people use to do estimation, came up with the notion of trying to resolve this problem by putting percentages, putting, putting probabilities onto estimates. What he would say is at the beginning of a project, what you have to say is, here's my estimate, but it has a 20% chance of being accurate. Now, that's good from a mathematical point of view. The problem is, is that people don't understand what 20% means. This is 20%. <laughs> we have a 20% chance of success here if we point this gun at our head. Now, if we work for a few months, McConnell would say, things get better. We can say to our boss, we have a 40% chance of succeeding. Well, that's 40%. It still doesn't look very good to me. What about 60? I'm still not particularly happy here. <laughs> Even at 80, I'm not particularly happy here. <laughs> Right, is that, in other words, if you have to put percentages on estimates in order to present them in any kind of truthful way, we have the problem that people don't understand how percentages work. They don't understand what these numbers actually mean. 
So what we're really doing here is just gambling. And I think building a business on gambling is a bad idea. Some people have done it, admittedly, but I certainly haven't. I can't even put money into the stock market because I always lose money. So trying to build your business on this kind of notion is just really a bad idea. Now the next input into this process is the much maligned chaos report. It's maligned because a lot of people disagree with the approach that it takes and says the numbers are a little different. But everybody who complains about it, they come up with numbers that are in roughly the same category. So let's look at the actual chaos report. Is that the basic notion of the chaos report is that 80% of projects either fail outright or are so late as to be called failures. That's a big number. Now the problem with the chaos report is that institutes Panic. People yell, oh my god, there is a software crisis. Well, the fact is that there actually isn't a software crisis. The real problem is that we just don't know how to estimate stuff. In other words, it's not that things are late 80% of the time. It's rather that we don't know how to do estimates 80% of the time, so our estimates are wrong. So the point of the chaos report is not that 80% of things fail. The point of the chaos report is that we don't know how to estimate stuff. And, if, and that's proof of that fact. So again, if we have proof of something and we base our decisions on misinformation, on something that we know to be false, then we have failed in pretty significant ways. So we just have to accept the fact that we don't know how to estimate and move on, is try and do things in ways that don't require estimates. In other words, the real software pro crisis is not that we don't know how to estimate or that our estimates are wrong, but rather that we're building code that doesn't do anything useful. But it's the estimate that's driving that. Now, I will contend that hitting your estimate has no value. In other words, if the estimate is so important that you set up milestones that are driving your project and you are judged based on the fact that the thing comes in on time and within budget, well, if you've built the wrong program, you have not succeeded in doing much of value at that, at that point. So one of the other dysfunctions that comes out of the estimate culture is that we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're focusing on time rather than focusing on what the programs are actually doing. And it's in fact what the program is doing that's the important thing. So the Agile guys came along and they came up with this notion of the story, thinking that the story would somehow address this issue. The problem is, is that if you look at the way that agility works in most organizations, they don't really do Agile right which is to say people have notions about how things ought to work, and estimates are firmly in, ensconced in, that, in those notions. So they look at something like Agile, and they try and interpret it in a way that works according to their worldview. Now, if you think about a story, right, what is a story? A story is a short narrative that describes your users doing something that produces a valuable result. If you're doing Agile wrong, and this happens a lot, a story is just a disguised way of, say, of, of describing a functional requirement. Right? So a menu, saying, as a user, I need a menu item in order to be happy, that's not a story. Right? A story is actually a narrative. It happens at the domain level, it's actually a narrative. But how do you estimate that? In other words, we have this problem that the story has become the central part of the way that we're putting our software together, but it's a very amorphous kind of thing. Right? I, can, I can estimate a bunch of functional requirements because I know how long it takes me to make a change to a database or to add a button to a piece of existing code, but you don't have functional requirements in Agile systems. All that you have is stories. So that brings, brings us to something called story points, is that the story point was an attempt to reconcile these two opposing worldviews. In other words, a story point was a way of estimating the idea was that you attach a numeric value of some sort to the story based on the difficulty of doing it. The problem is, is that itself leads to dysfunction. Now, first of all, let's look at what story points started out being. Right? This quote is from Ron Jeffries, who came up with the idea of story points. And notice that the whole point, so to speak, of a story point is to obscure time. Because they had a bunch of managers that were obsessed by time, as many managers are, and Agile is not a time-driven process. So they came up with the notion of story points in order to get this guy to not have to think about time anymore, so that they could tell him something time-like, so he'd be happy and go off and do his stuff, make his charts and stuff. And they could meanwhile get work done. Nonetheless, that guy still wanted estimates. 
So what you ended up with was the madness of taking story points and turning them into time. And we've all seen that, right? One point is about half a day, and two points is a day or so, and three points or six points is going to take most of the week, and, right? Is that, in other words, what we're doing is we're starting off with a thing that existed in order to not talk about time, and suddenly we're talking about time again. We're back to estimating. Now, you could solve that problem, is that you could use a, a, a difficulty scale that was not easily convertible to time. And if any of you are forced to do some kind of story point thing, I strongly recommend that you do this. Is to forget about the numbers. The numbers are too easy to misinterpret. They're too easy to, to, to uh, turn into estimates again. This, at least, is giving us some piece of useful information about the story that we can use to prioritize it. The other issue is velocity, which is also tied into this. Velocity is another destructive force in organizations. Right? Velocity is usually interpreted incorrectly as some kind of measure of efficiency. It's, what it is, from my point of view, is a ratio. The ratio between the time it would take to do a project if you had absolutely no distractions at all, and you were working on it eight hours a day, and you were doing nothing but working on it, to the amount of time that it actually takes. As far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a decimal number in the range zero to one. It's a percentage. Now, what that means, among other things, is that the team cannot do much to change velocity. In other words, if you look at the velocity between the ratio of, perfect, of a perfect environment and an imperfect environment, the only way you can make that number larger is to improve the environment. In other words, the reason velocity goes down is usually because the institution has put obstacles to the way, in the way of work. And those obstacles, those processes, forms that you have to fill out and stupid stuff that you have to do, right, is that those are the things that are bringing your velocity down, that are slowing you down. Nonetheless, in a dysfunctional company, you'll see lots of situations where the managers are saying, we have to improve the velocity. Uh, this, or rather, what they say is, the, this team has to improve its velocity. As if the team is made up of slackers that are sitting around reading comic books all day. And if they just stopped doing that, they could actually get some work done. Well, that's not what's happening. Usually what's happening is that the organization itself is putting, in, is putting in place the very obstacles that are slowing the teams down. But when you bring that notion of velocity into play, all of a sudden we're back into the realm of estimation. So the notion of points per sprint, we have to earn points. I hear this a lot, right? We'll be credited with our points, because if not, our velocity will go down, and then our managers will get upset, right? Is that's really, really, really wrong thinking because it just gets us right back into the role of ridiculous estimates, right? Because the points have no meaning either any more than a time-based estimate would have. So the real problem is that estimating software is like estimating physics, is that we're thinking about estimation in the wrong way. We're imagining that it's like a manufacturing process. How long will it take to develop that warp drive? Oh, I don't know, 10 years? Well, 10 years from now, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> you don't have that warp drive 10 years from now. Your head is going to roll, right? Is that it's not, we're not, we're not esti estimating something that's estimable. Why we would do it is another interesting question. Now, I think it has to do a lot with ritual. The matter here is exercising a ritual. He swings a certain number of times and then he just gives up, he steps back. And then he wags his hands around and he touches the tip of his bat, right? This is all ritual. This has nothing to do with actually being able to hit the ball. The interesting thing here is look at the catcher, right? The catcher is going, is having a conversation with the umpire. He's not paying all that much attention. You know, he's saying, hey, Fred, how are the kids? And meanwhile, the batter is doing stuff, but the catcher and the umpire are having nothing to do with that. Want to go for a beer after work? Yeah, sure. Is the, you know, is it, is it, see, see what's happening here. There's a disconnect, in other words, between the people on the team. Is that the fact that there is ritual in play is actually doing damage to this process. In the sense that the catcher is completely disengaged. And he needs to be engaged. So we have a word for this, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. 
right? In other words, what we're doing here is setting up a situation where we're performing the same ritual over and over and over again in the hopes that it will achieve useful results. But that ritual does not. There's no difference between the ritual of estimation and the ritual of locking your door seven times as you leave. It's, a, it's equally irrational and it achieves exactly the same result, which is to say not a good one. The other motivation is fear. In other words, it has to do with spending money. I can't invest a million dollars or a million pounds, whatever unit of currency you want to use in a, in a large project, without an estimate. I need to know whether it can be done in a certain amount of time. Well, there are lots of ways to address that that don't have to do with estimation. So for example, well, instead of talking about a year-long project, let's talk about a month-long project. That's way cheaper. And let's build it for you. I'll guarantee that we'll be done at the end of the month. At that point, you can look at what we've done and we can make some sort of decision about whether we need to continue or not. In other words, what I'm doing here is reducing risk by thinking in an agile way, right? If we're doing the wrong thing, we have the option of fixing it here, really early. It's not like we're gonna go a year and then nothing's gonna work. Um, and more to the point, we can give ac accurate projections. So that's the, the direction in which I'm moving in terms of this talk, is I want you to not be thinking about estimates, but to be thinking in terms of projections. So let's move in the direction of projections. Imagine that you're looking at your backlog. The backlog is just a big pile of things that have to be done, to-do lists. Is that in an Agile shop, the backlog is a list of stories. So it's the list of the stories that have to be completed. Here we have a 100-unit backlog, which is unaccept uh, unacceptably large. Though I was just talking to Jules this morning, who was talking about a 400 story backlog in a project he was working on, which is bordering on insanity. Now, why is that? Well, the top 10 stories are probably correct. They're good enough that I can pick them off the heap and start implementing them, and when I implement them, if I succeed, I'm probably not wasting my time. The next, story, next 30 stories or so, they're definitely gonna change, but they're probably just gonna change a little bit. There's still elements of correctness there. In other words, we'll learn things in the process of doing the top 10 stories that impact the way that the stories underneath it on the backlog work. The bottom stories, though, that's just wild fantasy. We have no idea what's going on down there. So much is gonna be learned and so much is gonna change in those top 30 stories that the bottom ones just have no relevance at all. Which means that what we should really do with those bottom stories is just toss them. Any backlog that's got 100 stories on it has got something really wrong with it because we're talking so much in the future that uh, we can't predict. If you, if you take the something in the bottom story and you throw it off, throw it out and it turns out to be necessary, well, you can always add it back, it's not a big deal. Now, going back to the original list then, time spent doing estimation is gonna depend on the value of the story. So, up at the top, time spent doing estimation is mostly waste because you're gonna produce these things so soon that what value does the estimate have? <laughs> There's no point in estimating them. You go underneath there and it's just hideous, it's moved into the hideously wasteful category. Because not only uh, are they gonna happen relatively quickly, but we don't know what we're gonna do. So no matter what our estimate is, it's gonna be based on, uh, on incorrect assumptions about how the, software, how the software works, what the software has to accomplish. And of course, the ones on the bottom were into mentally deranged, mentally deranged territory. Right, is that there's no reason in estimating down there. And uh, this uh, tweet from Paul Clip is I think very much to the point because he's talking about re-estimating stuff down on the backlog. There are many companies that insist that we provide story point estimates for every item on the backlog, all hundred of them. Well, believe me, putting an estimate on item 98 is a complete waste of time and re-estimating 98 because something changed above it, that really is in the mentally deranged area. It's just a complete waste of time. So how did all this come about? It all came about, I think, since I need somebody to blame, from Frederick Taylor, who came up with his notions of scientific management. This was all based on assembly line, assembly line work, and it was all based on the idea of the time manager on an assembly line, the guy with the stopwatch. And this was a guy from management. It was somebody that was walking around with a stopwatch, checking the amount of time that it took to do everything on the assembly line. And then if things didn't work, you then sat down with the time boss, and the time boss told you how to change what you do in order to improve the time on that stopwatch. 
Now, we manufactured things like that for a long time, and it didn't actually work very well. And things got way better in the 70s when Taiichi Ono came along at Toyota and came up with the basic concepts of lean manufacturing. The most important concept in lean manufacturing, to my mind, is the notion that you give the watch to the people who are doing the work. In other words, you empower the people on the assembly line to decide how they're going to work. There's no longer a manager with a stopwatch. Rather, you say to the guys who are doing the work, do the best job you can and figure out how to do that. Now, I know that if you say that to a bunch of programmers, they're not going to be doing estimation because they know that estimation is worthless. The only reason we do estimates is because our bosses force us to. You give the power to the workers and they don't do that anymore. Now, power to the workers sounds awful socialist, but believe me, Toyota is not a socialist organization. Is that this works. Now, there are a lot of other good things that came out of Lean. First of all, the developers are now controlling time, which means that an estimate is under the control of engineering. You will never have a situation, given a, a Lean philosophy, where somebody outside of the engineering organization will tell you how long you have. Time is entirely under your control. Now, because of that, the business side has to do something, and its responsibility is to decide what to build. Not how long it will take, but what it will build. You get to say how long it's going to take. Now, that's still a kind of estimate, so we're just moving in the right direction. But there's some important changes that happen when you think about that. In other words, where there's no longer an estimate with a manager who is forcing you to hold on to that estimate. The guy, the time manager with the stopwatch has gone away. In other words, nobody's ordering anybody around anymore. So this changes the management structure of the entire company, this one piece of thinking, is that there's nobody who's forcing you to meet your schedule. That person is gone, just disappears from the scene. In fact, it affects the organization as a whole. If you don't have a schedule, what do the managers actually do? Right? Most managers, what they do is they control the schedule. Right? That's their job. Right? They make charts. They keep spreadsheets. They check, pay attention to time. They make sure things are happening according to schedule. Well, if you don't have a schedule, what does a manager do? And the answer is nothing. So you can just get rid of them. <laughs> that makes the organization a lot smaller. And while we're at it, we can just flatten the entire class, ar class hierarchy, <laughs> flatten the entire uh, uh, organizational chart, the, the entire org hi hierarchy. So agile organizations and lean organizations tend to have very flat hierarchies like that. Now, there's another important change, though. If you're giving control over how you do work to the people who are doing the work, then the people who are at the top of the hierarchy have a completely different role. What it does is it flips this whole picture upside down. In other words, management becomes a support role. It's the role of the manager to support the people that are doing the work. So if you have a management situation in an agile world, what will happen is the manager's job is to take away all obstacles to work. Everything that the team needs, it's the manager's job to make sure that they get that. He's not telling them what to do. He's helping them do what they need to do. So this all falls out, then, of getting rid of that stopwatch. The other issue that's important is this notion of waste, also an important part of Lean. Lean is all about eliminating waste. Well, what is waste? And Ono's definition is if it doesn't put value into your customers' hands, it's waste. Estimation is waste. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we do in an organization is waste because it has to do with the internal machinations of the organization. It does not have to do with actually putting valuable stuff into the hands of the customers. So we need to eliminate waste whenever possible. Now, what about estimates? I would argue that all time spent estimating stuff is waste because no amount of time making an estimate is going to put a piece of valuable software into the hands of your customers. It's just not going to happen. So the estimates have to go into our trash can, too, because they're not providing value. You do have to do accurate projections, though. In other words, we are running a business here. It is the case that, it is the fact, rather, that time matters sometimes, right? As things have to be done on time. Is that if it's something is not finished by a particular trade show, then the company is going to lose half of its income next year. If you're doing something that's going to regulatory framework, it's got to be done by a certain time. 
So we have to have projections in order to run the business. But the reason we want those projections is to make two decisions. The first one is, shall we kill the project? That's a decision you want to make very early. In other words, you want to be able to say, this project is really just not worth doing, is that I can see right now that we're not going to be done on time. The other, thing that, the other decision that you might want to make, though, is that if you see that you're not going to be done on time, is should you add more people? Now, you can't add people late. That's, that's Brooks' law, right? Adding people to a late project makes it later. But if the project's not late, adding people can work. So in both of these cases, this is a business decision that we want to make early in the life cycle of the product. Now, if you think about estimation approaches, though, you don't know that you're in trouble until the estimate slips so much that it's obvious that, it's obvious that, you're, that you're in trouble, which is much later in the project cycle. So from a business point of view, estimates are not helping here because it doesn't allow us to make these decisions early enough. What you do need to do is count. That's the one thing you need to do in order to make projections. You need to count. We're programmers, so we count in hex. Now, to look at counting, I want to resort to some slides here. As Vasco kindly let me use a couple of his slides in this presentation. I, as a condition of that, I said I would plug his book, which I'm happy to do. So this is Vasco's book. I strongly recommend that you go to this website. You can read the first chapter. Um, Vasco has done a lot of really interesting work about no estimation by actually measuring stuff, by actually collecting actual numbers from actual projects and looking at how they play out. And they play out in really interesting ways. This is a cumulative flow diagram. I don't know how many of you have seen something like this, but these are very valuable pictures. What the columns are on the left is each column represents the total number of stories. This is an Agile project, but it could be uh, function points or anything else you want to use for, for an estimation, if you will. But in this case, it's stories, the total number of stories that comprise the project. When a story is finished, it goes down into the blue area. When the story is unfinished, when it's on the backlog, it stays in the red area. Know that the back, notice that the backlog gets larger. It always, backlogs always get larger. So we can make projections using a cumulative flow diagram that are valuable. In other words, if you project the total number of stories, and then you also look at the rate at which you're completing stories, the place where those lines cross is the time that the project is going to be finished. Is everyone following how this is working mathematically? This is pretty valuable. Now, the interesting thing about this diagram is to compare this to different kinds of diagrams. This one is, is showing the story points, is that these story points are all, the, the total number of story points is in the 70-ish range. And these story points are computed using a Fibonacci scale, which is one of the ways that people like to do it, is numerically. They say, you don't say one, two, three, four, and five for story points, you use a Fibonacci sequence because if the number, if you can't predict if something is harder than it's, a lot harder, it's not a little bit harder. But interestingly, if we just go to story points being one, two, three, the result is almost identical. So the question is, why are we messing around with Fibonacci story points? The really interesting statistic, though, is this one. All that Vasco is doing here is counting the number of stories. Or to put it another way, if you're going to insist on doing story points, all stories have a point value of one. Now, I guess this is estimating, but it's not really estimating. All we're doing is counting. And if we superimpose these three pictures on top of each other, a really interesting observation happens, is that they've all come up with more or less the same time for completion. We're within 7 or 8% here. So what this is telling me is that we can do something really complicated. We can do story point estimation based on a Fibonacci sequence, spending hours and hours and hours in planning meetings trying to figure out what the story point value of every story is. Or we can just count stories, and we get the same number either way. But if we're just counting stories, that takes all of 20 seconds. So eliminating waste is definitely a possibility here. If you look, look at the time spent producing these estimates as being waste, well, we don't need them. I can just count the number of stories, and I can make my projections. And if that number is too far out, right, if this, this area down here is too far out, I can kill the project, or I can add people. Because if you add people, then the slope of this line will get steeper, and then we'll have an earlier delivery date. 
So counting stories is enough. We don't need to estimate anything. All we need to know is how much work we have to do. Now, the other, the other slide that Vasco uses that I really like is this one, where we're talking about how predictive is it. Right, what we have here on the left is the output of the team, the actual output that is both predicted and actual. Does everyone see what I'm saying here? In other words, we're predicting a certain amount of output. We look at the actual, and we find here that 20% more happened than we expected when we were using story points as a means of prediction. And again, story points are a kind of estimation. On the right here, though, we have, again, almost exactly the same result, but all that he's doing there is counting stories. So in terms of the predictive power of counting stories, it's almost identical to the predictive power of working with an estimate. And this is only three iterations we're looking at. Go to five iterations, the numbers are almost identical. In fact, the number on the right is identical. Is everyone, everyone following what I'm trying to get at here? In other words, the, the point I am making is that counting stories is more than good enough if what you're trying to do is make accurate predictions from a business point of view. And that doesn't involve any notion of time at all. It's just counting. Oops. Now, let's spend a moment and talk about how you might organize things in order to get yourself out of the thrall of estimates and be able to plan properly. Because, of course, business people want to plan. As soon as you say, we're going to get rid of estimates, they throw their hands up in the air and go, oh my god, I can't do that. It's I have to be able to plan. So how do you plan if there are no estimates? Best way of planning, I know, is to use something called a story map. This story map is a bunch of index cards that are just keeping track of our backlog, of the things that we want to work on. Stuff on the left is, is uh, too much, uh, too undefined to actually work on it. Uh, stuff in the middle is stuff that we actually can work on it, and stuff on the right is stuff that we, that, that's already finished. It's the stuff in the middle that matters. The, the map is organized according to priority. Priority goes down as you go down the map, and time as you move to, from left to right. So when you're working with a story map, what's, what the layers of the map are important is that we have our epics across the, the top, the really big stories. Things that are so big that they're going to take months to implement. Underneath that, we have the large, the set of user activities that comprise that epic. If I need to do stuff with email, I need to write emails, I need to send them, I need to look at them. Underneath that, we have the actual stories, organized in priority order. The, the one possible uh, example of how that might play out is that we might be doing some kind of account management system. Right, so the green stories across the top there, the large activities, we need to create accounts, we need to modify payment information, so on, so on and so forth. Now the, the story map is used in order to decide what to do next. And you decide that by working horizontally across the map. In other words, if I take one row across here, that's gonna give me the most important stories for all of the user activities in all of the broad areas that the program has to cover. So we have a fully releasable product at this point. It doesn't do all of this low priority stuff under here, but that's fine. This is a way to plan. Now, planning, of course, is a fluid thing, is that as we're working, this diagram is going to change. We'll be adding stories and removing stories and adding entire new categories. So this is not a static document which means that that chart we were looking at a moment ago is going to be changing all the time, too. But this gives our bosses, this gives the business people a tool that they can use for actually planning business activities, which is something that they used to be doing with estimates. But there's no estimation of time here. It's all just stories. And we can do our projections by counting stories. And here's an example of a bigger one that just shows you some of the categories that would exist in the in a larger project. So that's our best planning tool, is just the story map. All right? So let me sum up then. First of all, estimation is entirely waste. Everything that you do that's estimate related is time that could be spent programming. And since the estimate isn't getting as much, since the simply counting the number of stories 
gives us exactly as much information as we would get if we were spending a lot of time doing numeric estimates and time-based estimates. Why waste time doing time-based estimates? There's no value in it. The second issue is that estimation is actively destructive to the organization, is that the culture that supplies estimate, that, that uh, surrounds the supplying of estimates makes the organization work in dysfunctional ways. It forces people to work overtime. It forces people to uh, work on things that are not important in order to meet time-based time deadlines. It's just an immensely destructive force in the, in the universe of work. The third issue is that counting stories is enough, that you don't need a lot of time, that all you have to do is count. And that's a very simple thing to do. And it doesn't require any kind of uh, deep thinking, but it provides you with the projective tools that you need to run the business. And then the other thing, the last piece, is that if you always do the most important thing first, then you always have something of value. So you go back to that story map, and the whole point of the story map was to figure out what the most important set of things were so that you would arrive at a functional programming, program, functional programming, you could arrive at a functional program that did everything that it needed to do to be useful as quickly as possible. And again, we don't need estimation for that. So I'll finish up here with a call to arms is that the way we make these changes is just by refusing to do stupid stuff. Or more to the point, the way changes like this happen in an organization is by us explaining the sorts of things I was just explaining to our bosses and getting them to try it. It won't take much time to prove your point here. Remember the slides from a couple minutes ago, we were talking about three sprints, <laughs> five sprints. Doesn't take very long to prove your point. But the way this is going to work is by us pushing for it, not by imagining that somehow the people above us are going to sudden, and suddenly become enlightened and start doing the right thing. So I will end with an exhortation then, which is that you have to go out and hold the flame and, and convince the other people in your organization to do the right thing here. So thank you very much and have a good conference. <laughs>